Welcome to Movie of the Year, the only podcast that has the science and the screaming to unequivocally figure out what the best movie is of any given year. This season, we're digging into 1975, and this is another bonus episode where we're tackling movies not in the bracket that still deserve to be watched. This episode, Death Race 2000. 2000. Such a far, far away time in the future. I'm your host, Mike. I believe I was 14 in the year 2000. With me, you've heard one of the voices is Greg. I was 19 in the year 2000, Mike, and I have to admit, I don't remember this death race. Is that awful? I like. I know it was a big one. I know Mr. President got God at the end of it, but like, I guess I was kind of like just doing my own thing, and I wasn't yeah. paying attention to death races at the time. You've seen them one, you've seen them all. You got to know them later in life. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Now I fully have a grasp on what happened. And man, I got to say, like, um, this is the pre-9-11 uh, world, and it kind of shows. Yeah, it, everything got darker after yeah, this. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Joining us also, as always, is Ryan. I actually do remember when this came out. I learned about Death Races in 2000 from... I started with Fantasy Death Races. Well, actually, I, I played... Uh, Death Race 2K for sure. the Xbox, and then uh, I got into fantasy really hard, and then I finally sort of started to watch them on TV because uh, people call me a poser. Yeah, yeah, you got you got to get plugged into the the culture, and that's fair. I think uh, we are not alone. Joining us as sometimes, if there is a movie schlocky enough. <laughs> His shadow will be felled. It is the one, the only Taylor Will Hyde. What's up, guys? I crawled out of my little trash pit, and I'm here to talk about garbage. <laughs> uh, I was eight in 2000, um, so oh, I wasn't allowed. I wasn't allowed to watch uh, this death race because uh, my we came from a, a very religious home, uh, so my mom thought it was uh, too violent uh, for a child to watch. So um, I, I caught little bits of other death races, like if I was at a friend's house, they'd be like, "Shh, yeah. don't tell your mom." Um, but I, I, I came a little late to death races in, in adulthood and I never really got mm. back into them, but this one obviously is a classic. So I I've seen the replays of this one, but you instead of up- revealing our age in 2000, we should have just said how many points we would have been worth in the death race. Like oh, Taylor was a, a fat 100 oh, points yeah, in baby. 2000. He was definitely a Phoebe, but Taylor, <laughs> you, you were, you grew up in like a small town of Texas. So you, even though your family was religious, I, I did hear that the kids there did pain races. Did you never do those? Uh, uh, I don't know what I don't. I don't know what that is. I did one time try to ride really fast down a hill on my bike and actually hit the front brakes and then skidded yeah. uh, like fifty yards down a hill. Um, and that's that's, that's my version of a pain race. Okay, is that is the pain race the one where they each have a cross? And they, try, <laughs> they run it up a hill. Yeah. There, there's a documentary on Netflix about the Irish death race where they throw a wheel of cheese down a hill and then I'll sprint down the st- steep hill that I watched that everybody should check out. That's pretty good. That one is really good. Uh, a, a fun little spoonerism that you could throw in with that um, if you wanted to is a thing that they didn't encounter in this movie, but they could have, which was a rain pace. It was a speed that you have to go if it's raining. <laughs> You guys, hang on. It's raining out there. Drive safely in the death race. <laughs> please, please, Run faster. Please shift down to rain pace. This movie does highlight um, that all the different types of weather you would encounter as you move across the country uh, from 12 hours sunny, to get from every big city. Very sunny, sun dappled. Yeah. That's all the weather in future America. Dusty sunny. Had any of you seen Death Race 2000 or I'm going to throw it out there. Any of the uh, prequel, sequel, straight to DVD equals before. Are you talking about the Jason Statham ones? Oh, they, so there's the Jason. There's only one Jason Statham, 2008's Death Race, and then after that there were prequels to that Death Race Two, which does take place before Death Race. Okay. Uh, and then there's Death Race Three, which takes place between Death Race Two and Death Race One. And then there's the Death Lion Race King gave us one and a half for Anarchy. just that problem. And then Roger Corman went, "I'm not fucking done." Death Race 2050, <laughs> which is the sequel to the movie we're talking about today, and also and that was like in 2017. Yeah. <laughs> and I that think the, a Wyland, lot of work to do. the Wyland Corporation is involved in some of these, so it's also connected to Alien. I never had so considered I wa- watching this movie before. <laughs> like, I, I never, it didn't seem like it was on my radar to ever happen, and I'm glad that we were able to rectify that. I Yeah, I'd heard about it all my life. It's famous, I guess, mostly because of 
the second lead, I guess. But uh, I, I, no, I mean, like, it's a pretty famous movie. I had seen it before this week, but it was only because, as Greg and I talked about in the first bonus show, Day the Locust, when we were assigned the 1975 season, we both ran out and just, or all, all of us ran out and crammed as many 1975 movies as possible. And that was the first one I watched. And then got to watch it like three weeks later, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I had seen uh, this death race once before, uh, and I've seen the Jason Statham death race, I think, twice before. Um, so I is I've, that is the remake campy like this? It's it's not can't it, it did the thing that like the mid two thousands always did, which was it took a really a, a campy fun thing and made it like weird and overly serious. Um, it, as it, serious as possible. Oh yeah. my! God. It could have been great. It, it's Jason Statham, Ian McShane, and Tyrese Gibbs. It could have been fucking amazing, and it wasn't. It's it's <laughs> it's, it it's like the Zack Snyder DC Universe version of this movie. Ouch. Yeah, all the cars race really slow. Yeah, <laughs> they don't even like speed up the tape because that was such a great no. trick that you never noticed during this movie. It's they don't even truly. Speed up the tape. I do not like Greg's attitude so far. <laughs> I just want to put that on the record. Uh, Greg, if you play the soundtrack to Benny Hill at the same time you hit play in this movie, it lines up. Actually, you'll see heaven. <laughs> well. It sounds like we all just want to jump in and start talking about it and deal with Greg's attitude right at the forefront. I don't even ask if you guys liked it. I'm going to find out as we go along like a regular Sherlock Holmes. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, the death race begins. Hey, guys, thank you so much for listening so far. And let me just tell you that everything ahead of this commercial is much better than what came before it. That's my guarantee. While I have you here, let me tell you about a website. It's called yourpopfilter.com. And it's everything you need that's related to Pop Filter. Everything Mike, everything Ryan, everything Greg, everything Cassie, everything is there at yourpopfilter.com. While you're there, go to yourpopfilter.com slash Amazon. Make that your new Amazon bookmark and do your shopping from there. That way we get a little piece of the action and Amazon doesn't. Make sure you're also listening to everything that Pop Filter has to offer, which includes the Superhero Show Show, a podcast that covers every single TV show that's based on a comic book or comic book property, and Movie of the Year, where we sit down and try and figure out what is the single greatest movie of any given year. That's Superhero Show Show, that's Movie of the Year, and that's yourpopfilter.com. Rate, subscribe, review, bye! In the wildly futuristic year of 2000, the Grizzly Transcontinental Road Race is an annual event following the world crash of 79. Racers drive across the country while earning points for everybody they kill. 10 points for a man, 20 for a woman, 40 for a baby, 70 for the elderly, and 100 points for, and I quote, Thebes. Like a fever dream... Rocky from Rocky, John Kreese from The Karate Kid, Kane from Kung Fu, a Nazi lady and a cowgirl compete and bone their way across the embattled U.S. of the future. The movie was produced by Roger Corman, who wanted his own futuristic action sports film after the advanced excitement of Rollerball. He then optioned Il Melchior's short story, The Racer, got his frequent collaborator and writer of Little Shop of Horrors, Charles B. Griff, to handle the script, and character actor slash B-movie director Paul Bartel to bring the movie to life. The movie would go on to be one of the most influential cult classics, planting the seeds for everything from The Purge to The Hunger Games, and of course, the inevitable straight-to-DVD reboot. Taste Buds ask you this. Death Race 2000 seems to have a lot to say about a lot of things, but does it actually say anything, or is it kind of just making fun of other movies for acting like they have so much to say? That's what I thought. I thought primarily it is looking at every other movie and being like, you are ridiculous like this. You waste a lot more time. Uh, you deliver a lot fewer entertaining moments. But you are just as dumb as this movie seems at moments. You're not. You're not better than this. You're not doing even. Th- you're not doing even as well as this movie does. And then you're pretending like what you're doing is art when it's really, it's just this, but just fart. not as well. Yeah, farts. It's it's farts. Yeah, I feel like uh, the closest this movie ever comes to, like, making a, a, an express statement is the very end where that guy's just like, and and we love violence. Basically this the speech from violence. Once Upon a Time and in violence, violence, Hollywood violence. that the girl gives before she goes into Marilyn Manson. <laughs> like, <laughs> they well, raised that, us that on violence. Be, yes. 
on purpose because Tarantino said he was like Ray. He is the person he is because of Charles B. Griffith, the writer of this. So well, he just said Charles is B. Griffith, that, and so that's we're supposed to take that from that. That yeah. But yeah, I agree. I think this movie is basically just saying like, hey, other movies are really dumb, and they try they just throw a bunch of like messages like in there. Here's one guy with a message. Yeah. He's like, here's one guy with a message, and we're gonna run him over and just be like, <laughs> shut up. And like and like See, that's yeah, the end of the movie. Can't... Ryan. I didn't get that at all. I like I do not think that this movie is the best deliverer of messages. I don't know if it is even smart as smart as you guys are saying to like be able to <laughs> uh mock other message movies like that. I do think that there's a lot of that I I, I think that it was easier to say the thing that you wanted to say back then or make fun of the thing you wanted to make fun of um whether it's uh how government works or how tv works you know how the media works people work. uh, how, yeah how how the healthcare organization works which is something that i definitely want to get to and uh just blatantly put it out there and have almost new no nuance or subtlety and that's not something that we can really do anymore like we would hate that if it came out today and we also hate it when it does have nuance and subtlety but back then, we can just fucking do this and, oh, do you have something to say? Cool. Let's do it in this scene or not. I think that a, a lot of it just came with this sort of like really forced on but lovable world building. And it all just came with the stuff that they had to say, whether they knew it or not, is the way that I took oh, it. It's interesting because Bar- Bartel, the director, has said like he really tried to make it a comedy. And then Corman... I think really had some stuff to say. And so it's those two forces kind of battling it out. Okay. I read that it was the reverse that Corman wrote something or Corman like was producing something that was really terrifying and dark and it just wasn't working and then brought in people that we say live action cartoon a lot. Yeah. This has to be the pinnacle of that. Somebody literally picks up the paint in the middle of the road and drags it to a tunnel, and they, somebody crashes into it. <laughs> oh, this is that, that Wacky Races show, amazing. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's Wacky Racers, the show, yeah. the movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but I, I think that like it still manages to be very, very entertaining, obviously, and that's the that's where I think it does such a good job separating oh, yeah. itself from like films. Uh, or d- and yeah, doesn't mm-hmm. sacrifice the entertainment like the Jason Statham one probably does for yeah. the message. Like, if you get a message, cool, but we're still going to throw blood, yeah. red blood everywhere. And keep, keep in mind, everything we've talked That's- about in, in 75 has been a movie about how the world is mad and how people mm-hmm. like feel like they have a worldview that works and it's being actively abandoned at the moment. And so for the whole thing not to really make sense or really hang together... That's 75. I mean, this is like the same like sort of violence and media and culture falling apart that we just talked about in Dog Day Afternoon. Yeah, I feel like this movie, the way that it's structured, you could read it as uh, just it's making fun of movies with a message or it just sort of doesn't have a message or it's wearing everything on its sleeve. And you can take all those interpretations and be like, probably right. And for me, it doesn't affect the enjoyment of the movie whatsoever. What the goal of that was, because it works you know what you still get either Taylor. way. What, what, regardless of which one of those you choose, you still get Sylvester Stallone being mad at somebody who called him Dr. Frankenstein and then driving yeah. into a ditch to kill that person. <laughs> that fucking <laughs> I, fisherman I, and just chasing yes. him around for 10 minutes. I love who would have been safe if he just didn't run. Yeah. If he'd stayed n- at the bottom of the tall cliff, a car couldn't jump. <laughs> Did that guy say that typically around here we use a bulldozer if we want to get through to the next city? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Listen, we've all we've all been growing up in rural <laughs> Texas. You guys use bulldozers to get to the big city? You- yeah, and we're like, ah, you got to get the dozer out. We if this go movie does have a again. message, though, it, the message is, hey, viewer, your time is valuable. And since we know your time is valuable, like, we're not going to waste a bunch of it. We're going to get into what's going on. And, like, it, the movie moves at a nice pace. It's over in, like, a firm 72 minutes. Right. It, like, it, uh, the, the I, respect for my personal time it, that this movie shows is, like, unparalleled, I think, that, uh, anything we've done on this show before. And it's dealing with <clears throat> the viewer's time and what the viewers should appreciate at the same time. It does feel like it's giving us what we want while being like, you're just as bad as these people who love the real death race. And sure, if you think that movie, cool. You know, I, I am. I, I'll be the first to admit it. You didn't even have to tell me that. I I knew it before the movie. Oh, yeah. I'm a... 
I'm yeah. a little piece of trash. That's why I'm and here, spanking my little bottom. But, but we're going to do that all <laughs> yeah, season with 1975. We're going to be made to feel like the problem because we're watching the media all the time because we voted poorly because we put the people in power or we don't do anything, really. That's the thing is that we leave, live these like static lives that don't make changes. And Death Race does that, too, but it has it's so much less nasty. And I know that sounds crazy because of the subject matter, but right. we, you know, we just watched shivers. We just watched day of the locust, like uh, everything dog day afternoon, even like it really hits you hard. Bitter, and grimy this, movies. Yeah. That like, look how fucking dirty you are, bro. And this movie is like, Wee! <laughs> I do think, yeah, this movie's like one of our main characters is a literal Nazi, and we're not really gonna address that. <laughs> and she's that not the at worst all. of the villains. That's just like a like it is a cartoon. Yeah, she's just sort of mid tier. It, it, I think the message, if trying to parse out the different messages, it could be talking about the the one that I think is clearest is probably the least important if you're trying to rank messages. But it is, uh, you don't really know your celebrities you fawn over, and they don't care about you. <laughs> That's the one that is. Very clear the whole time. And I'm like, I understand that anything it has to say about healthcare or the government or big media gets real messy. But that one is in Machine Gun Joe Kelly is very clear. (laughs) And everybody else. Uh, The other thing, too, that is sort of along those lines, Mike, that is not the most subtle, but I think well done is the the media which is all over the place like it's it's there to explain the rules constantly in like the first 30 minutes but it's also there to like make fun of the media and one of those like my personal friend one of those rib yes everybody's a personal friend one of the ribbings of the media is how they go to the house of the first victim of the death race immediately (laughs) and she's got tears in her eyes but she's real stoked to be on tv and that sort of balances it out you know and there's it's those little moments that aren't such flashing messages that i do appreciate and also, that TV character's Grace name was yeah. Grace yeah. Pander. <laughs> I, this movie in, is in, king like, of you, names. You can't wear it on your sleeve much in, more. In the yeah. announcers is where I really see... I don't know if Susan Cain, I really do think the writer of The Hunger Games, she was mostly just whole cloth ripping off Battle Royale. But in the announcers and the way they deal with everybody oh, yeah. is fully from this movie. Like, do not sell the author of Hunger Games short on what she was ripping off, all right? There is a whole <laughs> swath of things. But I, you can rip off more. Pay more homage, Taylor. Taylor. Pay homage. I, but I love this shit. Everything I said in the intro, from the Purge to the Hunger Games, that is just Mike fucking fodder. This I, guys, this movie was dope and it does dope shit. That is all see, the time we have to talk nope. about messages. Nope, Greg. The Hunger Games is a perfect example, though. Like, Hunger Games acts like it's not a, a bunch of B novels or a bunch of B right. movies, <laughs> but uh, it really is like that's th- this this movie is basically saying this is a B movie, and most of the movies that you like think of as blockbusters are also mm-hmm. just B movies, but they just have like a couple extra million dollars thrown at every single scene, and too self serious. Then yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so like if you are doing the same thing as this schlock, but you're just spending way more money and wasting way more time. Then, like, what does that say about you? At least this thing is self-aware and is just aiming to be pure entertainment and not act like it's something better than that. But see, I sort of like that. I mean, like, it's reductive, but it works. Like, you're Kubrick or Cassavetes or you're Corman. Yeah. And if if you're in the middle, go fuck off, dude. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Why be in the middle at all? Though I, the guys in the middle aren't trying to be in the middle, are they? No, they're it's- being. They're being on the the b level and then acting like they are auteurs and we are serious (laughs) my name is david yates and you will take my film seriously i just pulled a name i got nothing against that guy he's fine all right we gotta take a break and when we come back more death race 2000 Hola, Felterinos. I just wanted to interrupt real briefly and say thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. If you want to support us a little more directly, you can go to patreon.com slash yourpopfilter. There, depending on what tier you pick, $1 a month, $5 a month. If you're crazy, anything more than $5 a month, don't do that. You can get extra content. There's extra shows, extra series, uh, behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, you can pay for ryan to draw you a picture Uh, i can write you a poem you can get the shirts off our very own backs all of that and so much more over at patreon.com slash your pop filter 
While you're on the internet, you should check out Shady Monk. He does all the tunes you've been listening to. He's on Bandcamp. He's on Spotify, uh, SoundCloud, wherever kids get their music these days that I'm too old to know. Shady Monk lives there. Uh, you can probably follow him on Twitter and Instagram as well. That's Shady Monk. Wherever you get music, check him out. Taste Buds, Corman films aren't known for their acting prowess. How do the stars rise to the occasion in this film, Ryan? I mean, let's start with somebody who I, I when I heard that he was in it, I thought it was going to be for like 10 seconds, you know? Um, that's just how this works. Before people get famous, they're in 10 movies for 10 seconds. Sylvester Sloan is all the fuck over this movie mm-hmm. as Machine Gun Machine Joe Viterbo. Um and is it I think this is his best performance. This is probably his single greatest performance. This is the movie that does that asks Sylvester Stallone to do everything he's capable of and he does it. Yeah, it's like yeah. he he dialed in a very B movie performance for this movie. And then when he was done, he was like, hey, you know what? I'm just going to keep doing that on all the other movies, too. And then he just went he ahead just, and kept that, that style of performance. <laughs> yeah. No matter what anybody else is doing, Meredith Burgess is next to you. Nope. I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing. Sylvester Stallone has always sounded like a mafia tough guy who got beat up. You found him in the back of an alley and you were like, I'm going to make you into like a race car driver. He's like, oh, all right, okay. And like, so this is like the role he was made for. Like he was designed yeah. for this. Yeah. That seems to be in every Stallone movie. Like, oh, I'm going to make you a, uh, like a snow mountain cliff uh, <laughs> hanger guy. <laughs> all right, okay. It does make me, watching him in this, the role he was born to play, does make me think maybe I should go watch The Expendables because maybe that's him understanding way back early in his career at this point he's dude he's, he's just a puddle with eyes like he, he he's not a actor anymore is he really can he do this no he's like a baseball he, mitt full of hgh <laughs> like it, the guy has like the biggest case of potato face i've ever seen in my life <laughs> greg look other people might think he's attractive but you're saying you think he's just a big, dumb, baked potato? I'm saying he's just a big, dumb, <laughs> baked potato. I'm standing by that. The best insult in any movie he delivers to his navigator slash concubine, because that's how this world works. Uh, you got to have somebody to read your yellow pages, and they better let you fuck them and treat them like shit. Uh, he calls her big, dumb, baked potato. And why isn't everybody calling everybody that all the time? It is important, though. Like Even Mr. Frankenstein says to somebody who... like wants to join his cult right somebody who right. looks like she's about to blow up the building if and he's like uh so can i use your body then and she's like no well no and he's like okay well i have no time for you like it's such an important part of the death race to be able to yeah. fucking spill some seed whenever it's important yeah it feels like mad max level like but like 20 years after the fall like it seems like it, this should not be what's going on currently like th- there's a whole world that you can dive into with what's going on with people like yeah we just gotta dump some seed man gotta lit out lit out that weight <laughs> gotta speed it up dump seed and smoke weed am i right <laughs> and it, it goes both ways like uh, all you know all the ladies they get boy navigators oh yeah so they can dump their lady seed. I thought, is that a and weird heteronormative, they'll... like, we all yeah. are granted, like, one navigator to help us see our way, and it's always someone of the opposite gender. Well, the first victim, I would say, did not want a female navigator. <laughs> the guy from Karate Kid. John Kreese. John Kreese, Nero, yeah. Nero, Nero. Nero, this. yes. I do like, they're like, you know, all the literary greats, all the historical that you have Nero... You have Mr. Dr. Frankenstein. You have an Al Capone type, a Nazi, and a cowgirl. All yeah, the hits. All of them. The Al Capone type. Uh, last thing on Sylvester. Did he do a good job in the very beginning of the movie pulling out a machine gun and firing it directly at the audience? This is a I, death race. I couldn't tell if it was like, oh, nobody's safe, or look at me do my little bit with my little prop. Right, because it did. that's the only time in the movie where someone should be dying and it showed everyone just being like, yeah, go. It's yeah. like, it would seem like, it seems like that's the one time he was like, I am going to do a bit. This is like the fun thing that I add to it. <laughs> this is a little That's spice. like the WWE aspect of the yeah. Exactly. Everyone else for years had just been coming out and being like, I'm going to drive, what's up? And he was the first one to figure out, I'm going to make it a brand. David Carradine Somebody, is the other one who like 
he obviously kind of honed his acting chops in this movie, which is just a weird choice because he really yeah. carried kind of a very similar performance through the rest of his career, always being like sort of at the edge of acting. Like, yeah. you know, like, like just... That's the name of his book, right? <laughs> you know how people who can't sing, they sort of have this way of talk singing? Yeah. That's what he does with acting. He, like, talk The acts. guy from Cake. He, and he did this to distance himself from Kane in Kung Fu. He was like, this will really mark my... Nobody will see Kane anymore, anymore. Even though my whole life, I just knew him as Kung Fu until I knew him as Bill. Oh, Jonathan Kung Fu. Jonathan Kung Fu. Yeah, John, Kill Johnny, Bill is probably Johnny Kung. the time... Kill Bill is probably the time he finally turns it into an actual performance that works. Yeah. I mean, if we went through, if we had a season of Moody that was all hit Carradine's career, uh-huh. then maybe I, we, I'd be able to speak more about this. But uh, <laughs> it seems like Kill Bill is probably his crowning uh, achievement as far as acting goes. I do think, though, that he does fit into this. You know, we've been talking about this all season. We're going to continue. How 1975 had no need for a typical leading man. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And... You know, this is like he's he's a handsome guy, but not like what you would think of. He's got a style all his own, but not what you would think of. And Darth I, Vader without a mask is his style. <laughs> I definitely think it works for this movie uh, because yeah. he has to he has to be cool. You know, he he can only give away so much in order to keep the mystique. He has to keep the mystique of Doctor or Mister Frankenstein or whatever his name is as well. But he never really buys into his own hype like Joe Viterbo does, which yeah. I think is a big distinction between the two. Yeah, he's dry and sarcastic, but everybody assumes it's from, like, he can't really talk because of all the wrecks yeah. he's been in. But we find out he's, like, the fifth Frankenstein. Everyone assumes it's brain damage, all- but really he's just that yeah. way. He's that way, and he thinks everything's a little bullshit. But in a world where everybody buys in too much, they don't know how to handle dry sarcasm. Imagine being disillusioned with the death race. <laughs> this is too corporate. <laughs> They've Ugh. sold the death race out. Also, nobody had thought of, like exploding the government and ending the death race before him like he's the first person to think of it i think well, that's what makes him a hero he was the first person to say a hand grenade is normally something you throw at no, your no, hand. no i'm gonna make it a real life pun and i think he delivered that line better than literally any a- other actor ever could have. that's gonna be the single greatest moment of this entire year <laughs> yeah hand, it's a hand grenade, hand grenade. <laughs> the way the movie doesn't sit on it at all it's just like oh, yeah. very yeah. matter of factly like oh yeah i got this hand grenade which right away you're like does the president have to pull the pin on that, or how does that how does that work? I assume it's like a, a shocker, like if you shake hands with somebody, it buzzes in their hand. <laughs> the, <laughs> the only moment that comes close to working as well as that uh, comedically is um, after the end. They kill the president by knocking down the big stage he's on, and he falls in the car and dies immediately. And uh, the girl is shot. You know, uh, Frankenstein's about to die. They look at each other, and it cuts right to their wedding. That is how all movies should work. And and that's when this movie does deliver everything. And that that smash cut is like, oh, you do know you're funny. Yeah, movie. yeah. Like you don't do that and not know. That's what you're I doing. think. Talking about acting, like the only people in this entire movie that I was like, I don't, I don't care about you, were the people who were taking their role really seriously. Because mm-hmm. I think ninety percent of the cast knew what the movie was, and so they were all just like hamming it up. So it's like great, yeah. yeah. You're a you're a cowgirl who drives a race car, and absolutely. Oh, she definitely got what movie this was. Yeah, she she, she understood. You you can't be in a movie where at the end they call the main character President Mister Frankenstein <laughs> and not be and not be like, is this serious? It it is a really a, a movie that is confident in itself that doesn't decide to give that character another name after it's established he's just like a, a guy from a mill. They're like, yeah, no, that's his name, though. <laughs> is is with, with, focusing on the acting? Is there anybody who seems to not get it, or is this just like a stunning cast of everybody gets the tone of the film? I think. I mean, even Thomasina Payne, <laughs> uh, an old woman who is dressed more like an old woman in the history of movies, uh, she's got the little brooch in the middle uh-huh. and stuff. Uh, her whole like crotchety, like she is everything about her is awesome. She is a terrorist and she is a freedom fighter and she's still an old woman that will make you cookies all at the same time <laughs> these are all the best performances i think that the uh the the sort of culty girl who tries to sacrifice herself for frankenstein mm-hmm. comes the closest to like not getting it and even she goes so far into the like 
cult like persona that it comes back around the other and it's like okay this is fun again but she but she's a little too serious and that scene drags a little too long because it's like i i want the one yeah the, the one. <laughs> oh, i know who it's the guy who it's what there's three like uh greasers that have to jump uh-huh. into the sewer <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. but then the second one even though there's three of them the second one closes the manhole yeah and then the third one looks at it and says oh shit i didn't buy his oh shit i didn't i didn't yeah. buy it ah nerd that is also probably we don't, we're not gonna do this award but my favorite death is the car drives away so they think they're safe so they pop their heads yeah. back up and it instantly get fucking decapitated because it backs up that was very right. funny to me <laughs> Is is that why are they greasers? Yeah, why not? <laughs> well, because it's, it's a cartoon. It's like the so everybody has to be yeah. a type. Everybody has to be a yeah. something. It's it's a cartoon. The, the other great year two thousand. <laughs> they they knew greasers would be big again. They're gonna make a comeback. Um, I also have to mention real quick the two as far as performances go. The two guys who uh, build a fence and look through the hole and say, "Look how big this hole is." <laughs> oh, we're gonna get them, and then the car drives from the other side what just such what bad planning was their guy. plan i don't know they turned the fence around the wrong way we have to take a break and then when we come back of course more death race 2000 taste buds i ask you this why has death race 2000 remained one of the most popular b movies from this era is it because it's the most efficient of its own budget of our time of the available talent of any movie we in movie of the year history have covered Taylor. Um, I think that is absolutely a part of it. Um, I, I listen, if I'm going to watch a B movie, I am going to love a movie that is like credits included 80 minutes or under. Yeah. Uh, And the first 10 minutes are just, Hey, here's another wacky character that is insane. And like it just motors the whole way. Um, extremely Motors. efficient use, yeah. <laughs> extremely efficient use of time and talent, as well as um, use of. Uh, we discussed this earlier. Literal real life Looney Tunes gags, and <laughs> you just don't get to see that that often. It's like you, uh, some would argue Roger Rabbit fits somewhere in that mold, and then this movie. Oh yeah, that's all you got if you want live action Looney Tunes. Every location, every road, every building is like 40 minutes from every other location. Like it's all shot IRL. in between. The, the, there's like <laughs> a, there's one scene, the, pre, the president scene at the end where he gives a speech. That shot in Irvine. But the rest of it is all just in the Hollywood <laughs> Hills. All the, the cars look like, you know, impressive, but obviously nobody broke the bank to make them. It's like it, it does everything it can to get you to like maximum enjoyment and then it doesn't waste anything above that if the cars looked twice as cool as they look it, the movie would not be any better i actually saw that they apparently sold those cars for more than they paid to make them Hell after yes. the fact <laughs> so they actually recouped yeah. some of their investment and like made way more money off of it that is the perfect anecdote to go with this movie. That, like, they were able to sell the props at a profit. Like, that's efficiency to the max. And that just feels like a big Corman thing. Like, right. can, can we use these cars in another movie? No? Sell them then. Please. Let's, like, how, how, like, what is the way that we're going to make this movie profitable? I think he brags about the fact that he's only had one non profitable movie, and he counts everything in that. Like, selling the cars is a right. big thing. It feels like his whole career is kind of a tax thing. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. he's just playing three card Monty. He, I think another big part of it too is like, as as far as like why it's so legendary is it the downtime isn't there. Like I think mm-hmm. so many of these movies are played with big groups of people who are ready to pay attention to anything else at any point. If there's downtime, right. you know? the characters get naked. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say that. Yes, anytime that people are having a normal conversation, they're like, "Well, people might be bored." Boobs we'll just strip no out of the clothes. The, the one thing lacking in this movie is healthy dong. Yeah. There's no dong in Did they film. not do that in 75? Just have a little meat wagon hanging out there? Because we know at least the supporting actor does have yeah. that. So it's like, we should have seen that the shit. dong. That's what, like, we sign up for that just as much. And they never give it to us. I think, it, you know what I think it is? I think it's because if it's more than, what is it, if it's more than 40% erect or whatever... 
than or uh, i think it might be 70 percent erect than its immediate like nc-17 so no one can just like hang it out you can't be acting in this movie and be more than 70 i want to see the person you're gonna be nervous about all the spikes whose job it is to like figure out the exact measure percentage percentage of turgidity in yeah they have a level (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and wherever the bubble like, no, is we can't use this take you drop that down give me give me five percent down right now or else we cannot start rolling reverse uh, hey, this is always called looks like that. It's nothing I can do. i'm just telling you stuff. I mean, anybody who ever paid sylvester stallone more money to act than he got in this movie was wasting their money right because i'm pretty sure they just gave <laughs> sylvester stallone one of the cars and like that was it they were quits you were paid up for the movie uh, on IMDb trivia, it says that Sylvester Stallone was credited for improvising uh, many of his lines, and that's my favorite trivia ever because he doesn't have that good of yeah. lines, but yeah. he's still bragging about I, it. He <laughs> may have, we don't know this, but he may have come up with the baked potato line. I I guarantee you <laughs> that the baked potato line was a Sylvester Stallone because I it makes no goddamn sense whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> or the way he throws that clam sauce, that very realistic looking oh, clam yeah. sauce. He throws that clam sauce all over the place. Not a euphemism, listeners. Not a euphemism. I wish it was a <laughs> euphemism. The other thing, too, is that, like, we hit on this before, but, like, so much of the stuff is this weird work that we have to go through. We have to put up not just with the uh, the smaller budgets not being utilized correctly. I'm thinking of Shivers a lot right now, Mike, but there's mm-hmm. a lot of movies that are like this. But uh, we do have to put up with the directors trying to use it as sort of like a reel, right? Yeah, like, right. this is not going to make me famous, but, like, maybe I can show this off. And this movie is just so much, like, glee and delight that, of course, it would carry on more than something that's so much darker, nastier, and, uh, like, trying to be cinematic in ways that it's just not capable of. I'm, I'm very excited that we're doing Rollerball as well. Because this is, it's a similar movie, and like I, I think that there's real almost uh, Machine Gun Joe Frankenstein level rabid fandom hatred of the other one. Like uh-huh. some people froth of the mouth and say Rollerball is the better, and others say this one is, and that this movie was made out of spite. Corman <laughs> saw Rollerball was coming, so I love that we but get in your to intro, in your intro, Mike. He said he capitalized on excitement for a yeah. future movie. People That's... are excited. He that Rollerball was announced first. People were excited that it was coming out, and he went. We can do one quicker, and then we're gonna make a movie this weekend. Everybody, come on, let's do it. <laughs> I think he, he is the original. More asylum. movies should be made out of spite. I think that's the best way to make yes. a film. It just it gives you best way to do anything. Yeah, I think it just every album that has ever been made out of spite, I have loved. Like that uh, Dirty say Projectors for a... album that's all about his ex girlfriend. Great album. Probably shouldn't have done it. You seem like a real jerk doing it. Good <laughs> album. For a movie made out of spite, it's so weirdly joyful, though. Like, yeah. that's, I mean, that's part of its efficiency, is it's, like, joy per minute rating is very, very high. You know, you know what, dude? That's it, is that any movie, we can't have movies like this anymore because either we have to make them darker and explain all of our messages, or when it's joyful, we have, to, like, the, the people making the movie have to revel in yeah. it. They have right. to be, like, they have to wink at the camera and they have to say, like, do you see how joyous we're being? Isn't that cool? And that... That deletes joy. That's not joyful. Do five spit takes about the hand grenade instead of right. just fucking moving yeah, a on. A Deadpool movie I, with the hand grenade bit oh, would be Christ. insufferable. It would still be doing I, the fucking Kevin McAllister yes thing. <laughs> Deadpool would I still want be doing it. Roger Corman's Deadpool. I want that so fucking bad now. Oh. I, I this this makes me we'll also be doing uh Rocky Horror Picture Show, Patreon only, so you guys go over to your com slash Patreon and sign up now. Uh I want more midnight movies. This should this would be a great think about people dressed like Machine Go Machine Gun Joe and Doctor Mi- Doctor Mister Frankenstein. Like that'd be fucking awesome. I could definitely Yelling tape a stuff. white F to my shirt, my yeah. black shirt. Yeah, I could do that. You're you're a Frankenstein. Cult I do have girl. to say, uh, driving your car into crowds has become kind of big. Do you think that that's like a cosplay thing? Yeah, I've heard this that this movie is getting bigger and bigger with the QAnon set. <laughs> yeah, or just it, to, everybody being fine with a group of Nazis in the crowd. <laughs> mm-hmm. It really, this movie is I'm... ripe for a comeback. It's really, it's it's found its moment. <laughs> oh no, now I don't want it to be because fucking Ben Shapiro will say he loves it. <laughs> if Ben Shapiro loves this movie, I will literally eat a cowboy hat. I will eat a full Calamity Jane cosplay if Ben Shapiro. It can find any joy in any aspect of life. I've expanded it. Well, he might 
it's the first time he's been seen on screen as Herman the German. So I think maybe he'll appreciate it. <laughs> also, I, listen. A Rick Moranis looking Nazi. I we don't we don't like Nazis, but how perfectly cast and named was Herman the German. Just a weird little little German nerd who thinks he's part of the master race, but it's just a little weasel. <laughs> Let's all just dwell on Herman the what German a weird for a moment. Stinky that... he is. And I am glad that we uh, <laughs> have, as a show, come out against Nazis. Yeah, people have been emailing us being like, I don't know, you guys haven't been real clear yet. So finally, here, we're saying it, anti. We do not like yeah. them. Anti-Nazis here at Movie of the Year. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, it's award season. <laughs> well, that is very, very funny. Or very sad and perhaps now you have something to think about or very problematic and perhaps we have something to think about but in any event i'm sure you have some reaction to what you're listening to so why not check us out on the social media you can go to instagram or twitter and find us at your pop filter email contacts at your pop filter hey everybody keep watching them movies taste buds i hate to inform you that death race 2000 was not nominated for any Academy Awards. Did you double check that, Mike? Sound direction. Okay. Mike, why don't we get Do a we treble check on that? No, Sound no, no. Best adapted screenplay? No. Uh, best oh, picture. Oh, it was best Is this picture. the one Sylvester Stallone won an <laughs> Oscar for best screenplay for? That's a real <laughs> that thing? That is a real thing. It's not. It's, I, every time I think about it, it drives it drives me crazy. I think like, you have to mention it anytime you're making fun of him as much as we have tonight. You have to mention. Yeah. It. Oh, and also he has an Oscar for best He's screenplay. So the dunk Ben Affleck on us. of his generation. <laughs> he also made a movie called Oscar. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's that's how you get Oscar him. history Oscar for bait. you. So we will be giving Death Race 2000. I was gonna say not Sylvester so Stallone, but I can't say that. I don't know what you guys decided. Awards tonight. We will start with the cringiest moment in a film seemingly sometimes decided to make you cringe. Greg, as King Cringe, what do you got? <laughs> it is all fun and games to question the system, to um, say, to be an iconoclast, right? But I am not comfortable with depictions of running over the president. Uh, the, you know, you may not agree with everything Mr. President has done, but that doesn't give you Fucking the right simp. to run your car. Is this all yeah, of the presidents a year ago, would you feel differently? I, I, I think I would respect uh, the office. I think if you go back and run back the tape on, on the last year, I would say you've got to Okay, this is why everybody's been office. is movie year anti-Nazi, because one of you seem maybe like a sympathizer. <laughs> <laughs> So that that's it. That's, that's it. it. All right. kill, uh, kill, killing the president. <laughs> a little cringe. Uh, Taylor. Uh, for for my money, it's um, the the guy who's a member of the rebellion who seems to be a real a real a real firehead. He's a real real hothead. Um, he who clearly has a crush on um, our our Annie. little navigator uh, Annie, um, and. It's just kind of like I've got you. Don't worry. Um, and it comes down in the in the plane and then crashes and burns and explodes. Um, like a like a like a little wimp, not knowing that um, and he does not give a shit about him and is fully in Frankenstein now. That's pretty cringe, bro. Yeah, that's pretty cringe. That's beta. That's, cringe. that's beta behavior. That's it's beta behavior, and I won't stand for it in Every my time. No. Harrison the vibes Ford has crashed his plane. <laughs> it's actually to to save a woman navigating a male driver, and so he's also pretty cringe. Or just be Harrison Ford. Just be not particularly good at flying and <laughs> crash your plane for that stop. reason. <laughs> but net, yeah. But refuse to stop flying. Yeah. Ryan, what's your cringe? Uh, this movie is you know cringe on purpose. It does a lot of stuff like that. But uh, the one moment where I was like, "Whoa, shit!" Movie was when. Um, Sylvester Stallone's navigator was seen talking to um, Frankenstein after Joe Viterbo was talking to Frankenstein's navigator and walks up and says, what were you talking about? And before she has that long to answer, punches <laughs> her right in the fucking face uh, while she's naked, while getting a massage. And nobody yeah. says anything. Everybody's like, it's a living. It's, it's Joe Viterbo. Right. What are you going to do? Uh, we haven't done you, points until do? now, but guess what? Ryan gets that point. 
pound for pound performance, Taylor. For me, pound for pound, I think it is uh, Grace Pander. <laughs> I think that she is. Every moment that she's on screen, she's doing something incredible. Everyone Joyce else, Jameson. I feel like, yeah, I feel like everyone else they they had some dips, some valleys. Grace Pander delivered every single. Would moment. you watch the real Grace Panda show if she had a talk show? <laughs> oh, absolutely! I would hate watch it, but I would absolutely watch it. There, listen, there's a reason that the other people who were in the media all die by the end, and she's still kicking because she's the best. Her whole like thing may have been the most ripped off part of this movie that was put right into Hunger uh-huh. Games. Like, like the her whole deal was so much how the capital. Right was like formed in that series. Yeah, Stanley Tucci is just playing a gender swapped Grace Bander. <laughs> Ryan, pound for pound performance. I'm gonna give it to somebody who is known as the real <laughs> Don Steele. Yes. Uh, this is before who Twitter. Is, who is a different uh oh what happened on Twitter, Greg? No, just because like this is in seventy five he was in this movie as the real Don Steele and now like online you see like people's Twitter handle will be the real oh, right. them. Yeah, this, the this, real whatever. This is before that. Uh hell of a voice. Um he's always there to pander, much like Grace. Um he has the classic nineteen seventy five scarf. Oh, is he yeah. violence, yeah. violence, like, violence? You just, you... Yes. Um and uh, I just his ending of we learned our lesson. We got we went to a wedding and we learned our lesson. And then uh, Frankenstein's navigator was like, "Do we have to listen to this anymore?" And Frankenstein's like, "Hell no, we don't." And then they run over him and we see the scarf float. He wasn't the scarf; he was the actual guy. But I thought that he was great the whole time. He had the I think that he had the best idea, or maybe he was just being himself. But he had the best idea of what kind of movie he's in. Yeah, that's totally mine as well. They, he just really got it and like pushed it right up to the the edge of what would be too much. And I feel like he becomes almost like a like you know because he's an announcer, like a narrator for the movie, a little bit like a like a chorus. And I think that he is the backbone that really kind of holds everything together. And it's the performance, not right. the character, that manages yeah. to do it. His one of his better moments is when. Um, Somebody kills the like the head uh-huh. priest of the death race, like the Pope of the death yeah. race, and he just sits there and he he will not react until he finds out. Yeah, like, like he has no opinion <laughs> until he finds out that it's legal or not, and then when it's legal, <laughs> he's like, "Hell yeah!" It, it's so weird because the, there's him, and then there's Grace Pander, and then there's just some old crotchety windbag who's all. Why do, we don't need that, you, guy? You got nothing. You're bringing nothing to that's us. So Walter Cronkite. I. Uh, Greg and Ryan, you will share that point. Mr. Violence, Violence, Violence wins pound for pound performance. Finally, director's signature moment, Ryan. Oh, I have to give it to, we talked about it before, but these cars don't <laughs> go fast. Like, no. They just don't. And a lot of times they wouldn't work. Like you had to, like a lot of times when we're watching them drive, it's because they were pushed really hard by all of the crew. And then um, there's something that you can do to the camera to make it seem like they, like whatever the people driving the camera uh, or driving the car are doing, that's whatever. They're going to be in fast motion too, as the car (laughs) clearly is in fast motion. And it's not just, it's not just a way around it. It's not just a way to like make them look like they're in a race, but it's Mm -hmm. so B movie to me. It's so like, yeah, let's fucking do it because that, it's not something we have to do. It's something that like, sells the movie and makes it yeah. even more and the endearing. only way to get from st louis to albuquerque in 12 hours <laughs> or as greg said from <laughs> irvine to santa Ana. <laughs> greg director's signature moment for me uh it's gotta be just this like okay this is gonna be an expository scene so let's have the characters take <laughs> off their clothes uh i'm getting older and so i don't know if i find that as fun as i used to because i'm like too aware of what's been going on in Hollywood for since oh no what the beginning. Uh, no you know what don't but, tell me <laughs> but like <laughs> to just be like all right we got like seventy two minutes here um we're just gonna have them take off their clothes like seven times very much helps <laughs> and- set the tone for the movie. Apparently the director didn't want to do any of this so uh, Corman and the producers would be like to a second director <laughs> oh go shoot some B roll and it's plot and it's dialogue and it's just nudity. Uh, also, uh, you guys watched yeah. this on Canopy? I did, yeah. I watched this on Tubi, a uh, app with commercials, and also no. blurred out boobs. I have not seen any boobs of this movie Ryan, because they were all blurred out. We've seen 17 areolas this week. 
Taylor, director's signature move. Yeah. Uh, mine is also the, the the car's going fast because of the camera. Like, I listen, apparently there's a thing called undercranking because this was made when at a time where you still had to crank the fucking film camera. Uh, so they just cranked it slow and yeah, then they did. made it play fast again. And it's like, I think we uh, all did while watching this. Too. Yeah. Uh, but that, that is absolutely my, like what an incredible move. Uh, the, where the, the scene where it really shows. And honestly, it's kind of cool that they did it because I think that this was a safe movie to make, but the scene where it really shows is the uh-huh. bullfighting scene. <laughs> yes. Where obviously it would be dangerous to have these cars Fuck. that like hardly work <laughs> driving right near an actor. But they really wanted the bullfight, and they just went for it. And you know what? It it's it's fine. It, just, it works. The, they got it. The we entire the, concept of that bullfight is so dumb and the so funny. The conquistador just turned yeah. into a Keystone cop at the level he moved for a while. A conquistone. <laughs> we talked about the two guys with the fence that uh-huh. got hit by it in the back. What was that guy's plan? Like, were they like, oh shit, our conqui- uh, conquistador died? Like. Some people, was, some people in the in this world want yeah. to die in the death race, and they are not. They don't get to be the drivers, so they go out and they sacrifice it, themselves, or they just put themselves in it. In one the way or TNT another. original series, The Purge, uh, they explain this kind of mentality. Oh my god! <laughs> so maybe Death Race deserves a TV show about these kinds of people as well. Uh, for that one, Greg, you were going to win until it was shared with me that the director hated boobs. And it was all the producers, so that was more of a yeah, producer yeah. signature moment. So Ryan and Taylor <laughs> split that, leaving, I think... I can see that. That uh, seems valid. I think that's Taylor to half a point, Greg at one point, Ryan at one and a half points, making Ryan the winner of the show. We didn't prepare this, but we often do it. If you liked this, what would you also like? Taylor, recommend. Oh, if you like this, uh, you would probably also like... Uh... <laughs> Wait, we did prepare. <laughs> uh, I think you probably, you honestly probably would love Rocky Horror Picture Show if you haven't seen it. Uh, I feel like these are as separate movies as they are. I feel like they have a same ethos of of how they're mm-hmm. making a movie. But Taylor, uh, unless they unless they're patron unless they sign up for our Patreon, they won't even be able to hear our show about Rocky Horror. Well, that's good news because the Patreon is so affordable and so easy to sign up for. And then they'll be able to hear that episode as well as many others. Oh, man. Okay, very cool. That's a, that's a good point. Good point. <laughs> Greg, what do you recommend? Um, I recommend uh, a video game from the um, Super Nintendo and Genesis era, either Mutant League Football or Mutant League Hockey. I And what I recommend, more than that you go and play these games, somebody buy these effing licenses and make modern versions of these games. It's the same thing as... Video games or real leagues. life. Do, do whatever. Sports. Like, like yeah. we just let's need have, them let's have back. Uh, it was like all playing whatever sport it was, hockey or football, but then people would get like ripped in half. Uh, people would fall through the ice. People would get like beamed up into, <laughs> into space. It like had so much the feeling of this, which is at one. It's like a a exaggeration, but only a little bit. Like mutant league football is only slightly more extreme than the NFL, really. And it's honestly the that, NFL is full of way more monsters. <laughs> Boom. Ooh. Greg, were those imprisoned mutants that were forced to play sports for our entertainment, or did they sign the contract? Are they being paid the paychecks, and so whatever happens to them happens to them? Yeah, exactly. Like they make the choice. Eyes wide. Well, actually, different teams had different rules. I think there was a team that so was just that's like the Hunger that were, like, Games pressed into doing it. Districts <laughs> one and league. two are they want to be there? Right. Well, because they win so much because their yeah, kids train, train and, and they actually get to eat and stuff. Nutrients. Ryan, what do you recommend? I want to, Mike. I want to recommend something that uh, maybe not a lot of people know about. If you're super into like cars doing cool shit while people are acting their butts off, uh, this weekend that we're recording this, or in a couple weekends, um, F9 is coming out. Welcome back to theaters, uh, that's everybody. That's the ninth movie of a series called the The Fast and the Furious. I think people would enjoy this series if they took the time to watch it. I, F9. It's not just a button on your keyboard oh. anymore. I wish I knew what that short command was. Taylor, what's that short command? Uh, that short command is uh, close all the computers. Right, don't and press blow that, up. anybody. Oh, no! <laughs> uh, I I do. Can I 
plug sure. one more that I just remembered. Uh, I think if you like this movie, uh, you'll probably like the Wachowski Speed Racer movie, uh, which oh, is yeah. also just big dumb race car fun um and it's it's very it's, fun and got a bad just rap take the acid not first. on film but you, just like uh sylvester stallone chokes annie the navigator emile hirsch choked a woman so just imagine speed racer doing that because that that's connected to then exactly has any movie uh like has any movie stock raised more over the last 10 years than speed racer no. I, I can't it's believe crazy. Like, people are like that is a modern it's classic bananas. Uh, mine is, uh, I've talked a lot about the purge, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, the Belko experiment. If you want to see what like corporate America are making people do stuff, the Belko experiment, uh, is a little James Gunn thing where American corporations have, uh, offices in Brazil, close all the windows and say, I don't know, kill each other with office supplies. See what happens. Oh, oh sure. actually, Mike, can I do one more? Too. If you are into just everything that Death Race 2000 was, may I recommend The Diving Bell and the Butterfly? It's a movie where um, I think like the the editor in chief of like Vogue or something um, is paralyzed completely except for one eyelid, and then through a language that he and his helper create, he writes his um, biography just by yeah. Blinking. I I could see the Diving similar. Bell and the Butterfly. That's kind of Mr. Frankenstein like Greg. Do you have any other recommendations? They both got to. Man, I I feel so bad about not writing that this person had to invent a language <laughs> with their eyelid, and they still managed to fucking write something. And every That's time the, I you try, know what? It's I the only reason cried. they wrote anything. So maybe if you get paralyzed, you will. Another thing I'll recommend is uh is Twisted Metal, yeah. the Twisted Metal yeah. video games. Uh, driving around in your car, shooting people again, either back in the day or. Maybe it's time to reboot the Twisted Metal series. Uh, maybe. maybe. That is all the time we have. Thank you so much for coming to this bonus show, Taste Buds. Thank you so much for listening to this bonus show. Listeners, Taylor, you are the supreme guest. Do you have anything to plug? Um, guys, get out there. Look at some good fucking birds. Birds are all over the place, and you got to just look at them, and they look good. And that's what I got to play. All right, go look at some birds. I'm going to reveal here the next bonus 1975 episode will be Sallow with some special guests that I'd like to fix. Until then, keep watching those movies.